If you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to Acts. Acts chapter 26 is where we're going to begin uh, this morning. Acts chapter 26, and we're going to begin reading in verse 13. Acts 26, beginning in verse 13, the Bible says, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And we were all fallen to the earth, and I heard a voice saying unto me, saying, speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, del delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles and to the Gentiles and to them and to whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins, inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but shewed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the, and then to the Gentiles that they should speak and turn to God and do work meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore, the, having therefore obtained help from God, I continue this day witnessing both to the small and great, seeing none other things which that the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should offer, I mean, excuse me, should suffer, and that he should be the first and should rise from the that should rise from the dead and shew light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And that as he thus spake for himself, Festus with a loud voice said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning to make thee mad. And he said, I am not mad, most, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth. Uh, with soberness. For the king knoweth of these things before whom I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, from, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. And Agrippa said unto him, Almost thou hast persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God, not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were, mo were both almost and all together, for I, as I am, accept these bonds. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for all your goodness to New Testament Church. Lord, we pray that you would continue by your grace and mercy uh, to strengthen us, to guide us, to make us strong in the days which we live. Lord, we pray that you would restore health both physically and spiritually to us. And we pray, thee th we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I apologize for a, re a lengthy reading this morning, but I felt like that we should read the whole thing uh, to get the full thought this morning. And many messages have I heard from verse 28 and it says, almost thou hast persuadest me to be a Christian. Now, in some respects, that would, uh, that would almost be against what we teach as the sovereign will of God. But I want you to see that the, the bulk of this here is that, is that Agrippa heard the gospel.
gospel. And not only did he hear the gospel, he heard the gospel in a time in which the Holy Ghost was working. And we'll see that in a few minutes. And it was an almost thing. And you, you think about your own life uh, and people that you desire to be saved, and you think, well, almost. And my advice to you is just simply to keep praying. Uh, keep keep uh, pushing that one toward the throne of grace. Keep sharing the gospel. Keep praying for them, for our Lord he is faithful. It may take 20 years, but the scheme of eternity, 20 years, is nothing. And so we should, as the Lord's people, be faithful. Now go all the way back to verse 13, and we're going to see that uh, the Apostle Paul begins to witness to King Agrippa. Now King Agrippa did not have the authority to uh, sentence Paul to death, but it was right before the next one that he would sit under did have the authority to sentence him to death. And one of the reasons that Paul kept appealing his cause was not simply to extend his life, but it was so that he could share the gospel all along the way that he met. And, and so we find that uh, Paul is giving his testimony. Now, I would suggest to you as we read Paul's Testimony, and it's individual, as individual as people are, as different as people are, we see an unusual testimony that Paul enjoys, but salvation is still the same. Verse 13, at midday, at noon, what we call noon, the middle of the day, at midnight, uh, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light shining from heaven above the brightness of the sun. Now, I've never really seen this, but in my study, I want you to see, and if you mark in your Bible, it says, in the way. Now, if you're moving forward and something's in the way, it means it's obstructing your path. You can't go around it. You can't go through it. It stands in the way. Now, isn't it, you remember uh, Balaam's ass and all that she done to try to protect uh, uh, Balaam? And the, the angel of the Lord was in front of them, and Balaam's ass wouldn't go through it. Uh, she had more spiritual sense than Balaam did. But I want you to see it's in the very same thing. Paul could no longer progress in the life that he lived. Something was in the way. Something was obstructing him. Now you think about yourself and what a wonderful day when the Lord Jesus Christ came and obstructed the path that you had designed for yourself. That you thought it would be okay. That there in the midst of all your ideas and everything that you thought was right stood the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Paul couldn't have progressed any further in his life in the way it was going, even if he wanted to, because Christ stood in the way. It's a wonderful thing when Christ obstructs our own ideas and our own path, isn't it? Uh, that we don't have to continue into such misery. Now that, that's what uh, Paul, in relaying his testimony of salvation, what Paul uh, experienced on the road of Damascus. Now, I want you to see that the Lord always uh, produces light, the brightness of the sun shining around about him, uh, around about me, and then that journey with me. Now, I think it's very interesting, and we can see the election of God here, that everybody saw the light, but only one heard person heard Christ speak. And that is, that is indicative of the Lord speaking to the individual heart. Everybody saw the light. One person was saved. One person walked out of there redeemed that morning. Uh, one person heard, uh, uh, heard the Lord Jesus Christ speak. He that have an ear, let him hear. And we were all fallen to the earth. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice.
was speaking unto me. Now, I want you to see how individual that is. I heard a voice speaking unto me. And what my recommendation is, is to you this morning, have you heard the voice speak to you? Because, my dear friend, if you've not heard it individually, you've not heard it at all. Uh, we must be attentive with a spiritual ear. You want to be used of God, be attentive with a spiritual ear. Listen to us spiritually to what the Lord uh, is proclaiming and uh, be near unto that. Then he says, in, in, in the Hebrew tongue, his own language, his birth language, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? You ever thought about that? And certainly Paul was, was persecuting the Lord's church at that time. Uh, he went to Damascus with letters of authority to break up the work at Damascus. Said they dragged men and women out and be arrested. But have you ever thought that ye yourself persecuted the Lord Jesus Christ because you did? Two different ways. Number one, before you were saved, Delivered or not, you persecuted because you were ignoring who he was. Yeah. And secondly, if you're saved, your sins nailed him to the cross and persecuted him. He died for all his people, and the, the thorny crown and the stab in the side and the merciless beating that he was given, that was for me. And if you've been born again, it was for you too. And, and so we see that as Paul is, uh, is beginning this, the reason Paul persecuted Jesus, because it was his nature to do so. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now you think about this, very uh, un a uh, very routine thing, um, uh, the golding of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, back to our example of Balaam and his ass. Remember what Balaam did? He kicked that old mule a little bit more, didn't he? That's me and you. When we're under conviction of the Holy Ghost, we kick against it. Not that we desire hell, but our nature is a God-hating nature. We, we do not desire naturally the things of God. In fact, we are hell-bent against them. And, uh, and, and so, just as Balaam's ass was golden, here we find that already in Paul's life, some people suggest even about the time that he saw Stephen stoned, I don't know about, uh, I mean, it well could be, that he was being pricked in his heart of the reality of Christ. And uh, we desperately need that in the day which we live. Uh, have you seen Christ and him crucified? I suggest to you, if you have, trust him wholly with your soul. Verse 15, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Now, I want you to see the key of redemption is this, is knowing whom Jesus is. Now, I've never heard Jesus say unto me, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But I have felt the Holy Ghost say, you are guilty. I, I, I have felt the Holy Ghost uh, say, this is my beloved son. I have certainly understood and know that he died for me. And in that glorious moment, he rolled the stone away. He rolled my sin dead away, and I've never, ever been the same since. This was Paul's experience. Now, I would look very closely and see that you have one too. Uh, nothing, nothing else matters in this life. Some people say little else matters. I'll tell you this, nothing else matters. Uh, because when we're facing this, all the things that we have here mean less than nothing. An eternal home is all that we can look for. Uh, and, and certainly uh, we find here that uh, Paul 
was saying. Now, I, I want you to also see what's not happening. Nowhere in there is it suggested that he invite Jesus into his heart. Nowhere in that text do you find him repeat this little prayer. Nothing like that exists in the scripture. Dear friend, uh, run from that mess. It is not of God in any way. It's to, it's to uh, deceive people is what all that's about. But simply, he, Christ introduced himself to Paul, and that was it. Have you seen Christ and him crucified? That's all it is to it. We make it so complicated, and you know, uh, some people say, well, sovereign graces make it too complicated. Well, uh, in the very same way, uh, Armenian people do too, because they say you have to say this and say that. You know what that is? That's Catholicism. Repeating little prayers and that foolishness. No, no. Even they've got it messed up. Just know who Christ is. That's all we need. That, that, that's all that we have to have is knowing Jesus and Him crucified. And so we see that that is Paul's redemption. After he saved, verse 16, But rise, stand upon thy feet, I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Now, Jesus saved no one without divine purpose. It's not just so you can avoid hell. He saved you to accomplish something in his work. He saved you to do something for his bidding. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. It's very much threefold. To make thee a minister and a witness. So to make a, a witness, both, he's got a twofold ministry, uh, ministry, to minister and be a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things which will appear unto thee. So he had to testify what all he knew right now was that he was saved that he had been born again, that he had met Christ on the road to Damascus. He says, you need to share that with people. And you know what? Paul did that to the day he died. What a wonderful testimony. Every minute of every, of every time he could, even to the point of simply writing letters to people, spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Letters that we still treasure today and understand and know is the <laughs> it is the written word of God. And so also I want you to see in there, it says in addition to that, I'm going to reveal more stuff to you. This knowing the last days perilous time shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own self. We know the last days are marked by those things, and why do we know them? The Lord told Paul somewhere along the way. Now we don't see any vision like this, at least recorded, it may have happened, about when Paul received the, the information that we treasure for the last day in, but we know that it did. He says, I'm, I, I want you to share your experience here on the road to Damascus, and later on I'm going to tell you even more. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Yeah. That's someone who's growing in grace. That's someone who's continuing uh, in the face of all opposition. And we, uh, we certainly understand that. Verse 17. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee. Now I want you to see in verse 17 we find that his gospel, or I'll say this, his ministry from the beginning was to go to Gentile people like you and I and spread the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, whom did he go to first? The Jews. You know what happened when he went to the Jews? He fell flat on his face. And you know why? It wasn't his ministry. That was Peter's ministry, right? And, and you know what you're going to do if you go where the Lord don't tell you to go? 
you're going to fall flat on your face too. Because you go where he tells you to go. And so we, we see from the beginning, Paul's uh, ministry was, was for the Gentile. And God had, even before he had saved him, the Lord, the Lord God had tooled him to that ministry. He spoke five languages fluently, and four of them were Gentile languages. See, he prepares men for the work that he set them to do. And, and so we find that Paul was already set for ready, even then. To open their eyes, verse 18, meaning the Gentiles, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Now, if you were listening to Jared's teaching this morning, he, he made a very good point concerning the Gentiles and what they really were. And then we see a better point even made by Paul the Apostle. We were idolaters. And deeper than idolatry, and we never like to use this term when it comes to ourselves, we were worshipers of Satan. All the idolatry in this world goes right back to him, Belfomet. You, you say that. It, it's in literally every culture that exists. And that's an amazing thing to me. But you know what? It should not be that amazing because you, remember, that's man's bent again. We, we are bent that way. We are geared that way. And he said, I'm going to send you into a rough and grisly and mean and idolatrous crowd. You ready to go, Jared? And there I want you to spread the gospel. Now, man, that's not part of the stuff, is it? But you know what? Paul was obedient. In the face of almost certain death, and it did happen, he went anyway. See, sometimes the perfect will of God that I preach on so frequently puts you right in the path of full disaster. And you know what? We don't understand that this day. you got people like Joe Olstein preaching, uh, oh, if you just trust Christ, you're going to have uh, you're going to have a nine-bedroom house. That's foolishness. You will not find one word of Scripture to back that mess up. In fact, he said, I'm going to put you in the eye of the enemy. And you know what? Paul went willingly. How, how, how could a person knowingly go in such a horrible situation because he was saved? And because he knew that that was God's will for his life. And he did it until he gave up his life for the cause of Christ. And that's certainly what we should be as well. The end of verse 18. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. And that is in me. So he tells him his salvation experience, but he's not done. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Now, I want you to think about yourself, and, and, and I'll review me, and all the times of our life where we were disobedient. Now, he said, I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision, and I believe those days are past. I believe if any scripture teaches this is why Paul was the apostle born out of time, seeing, hearing Christ, not only this time, but from verses 16 and 17, I believe he saw him again later and, and getting that heavenly news. So where do we get ours? Well, it's sitting in your lap. If you're a praying person, it's the answer to prayer. When you see the Lord Jesus Christ's face and you find it, that's when you'll get your agenda. That's when you'll get your uh, Damascus Road experience. He'll tell you exactly, exactly who you're supposed to go to, who you are to share the gospel with, who are you to tell of the goodness of Christ. 
Paul was obedient. But shewed first unto them of Damascus, if you follow the Damascus church, what kind of church was it? It was a Gentile church. Damascus was in a Gentile city. He's doing exactly what the Lord told him to do at this point. But shoot him first of uh, but shoot first into them of Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, then to the Gentiles that they should turn to God and do work meet or required or indicative, meaning it shows true repentance. Now, in the middle of there, we see where Paul got off and he said, I went to Jerusalem and we see more than once him and Peter do this. You know why? Paul had no business being there. What church did he work, work out of? Jerusalem Baptist? No. He went to work out of a Gentile church at Antioch. And you know why? It was where he was supposed to be. And we, because he did get in the will of God, we are, works, we are still people of that work even today. We're saved because the gospel got to Italy. <laughs> We're saved because it went from Italy into upper northern Europe, and from there it came here. That, that, that's a completed work. It was all because one man desired to be in the will of God. And certainly we should <laughs> be in the exact same situation. He, <laughs> he desired God's will. Verse 21, for these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Why? Preaching the gospel. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, still doing his ministry, witnessing both to God, witnessing both to small and great, and saying none other than those things which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Now, uh, I, want, I want you to point out, and know all y'all understand this, but just for Campbellite people who re reject the Old Testament, what was Paul using? He said, just what the prophet said. <laughs> Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. <laughs> That's all they had. <laughs> he wrote the rest of it, and in the four Gospels, those men wrote that. He was, re he was using Old Testament, Old Testament scriptures proving that Jesus indeed was Christ, the Son of God. And he said, okay, and I'm doing it to the small. I'm doing it to the insignificant. I'm doing it to the people that most people wouldn't care nothing about. You know what? Even when he was locked up, he was held a cellmate about Christ. And you're like, well, how do I know that? Well, down, down in the jail... <laughs> Him and Barnabas had a party, did they not? They had a revival meeting among, and, and, and you remember, what does it say? Very significantly. Paul said to the jailer, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. I believe every man in that cell that night was born again, because had they not been, their nature would have told them to run. But they didn't. They abided there. Why? Because they were new creatures in Christ. And so we see that Paul certainly was faithful to this. And as he's relating to King Agrippa what he did, he was very faithful to this. Verse 23. That Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should shew light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Now I'm here to tell you that Christ suffered for you. Trust Him. Trust Him wholly. Trust Him fully. Put everything you've got into His life. He, he's noteworthy. He's trustworthy. He can get the job done. And as He thus spake for Himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad or crazy. 
Because what would Festus expect him to do? What would you expect yourself to do in the same situation? Please turn me loose. I'm sorry. Please, please let me out of this place. Uh, I won't never do it again. And Festus expected, you know, King Agrippa, I'm a Roman citizen. My mother was a Roman. My daddy was a Jew. And uh, I don't have, I shouldn't be held here because I'm a citizen as well. And that's what Festus thought was going to happen. That's what Festus would have done if Festus was in the same situation. I don't know. Paul shared the gospel. Paul said Jesus is noteworthy. Uh, Paul said Jesus is the answer. Trust in King Bertha. You ever thought about the turmoil we're in right now? And I'm afraid <laughs> my flesh would consume me and immediately if I saw President Biden or Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, that I would forget my real purpose. And I'd probably tell them how little I thought of them and how foolish I thought they were. When that's not what they need. What they need is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Paul didn't forget that. In, in, in the moment where he could have been cleared and left, he thought the gospel more precious than himself. That's unbelievable to me. That, that's past my understanding. Because I, at least I have the honesty to say I don't know that I would have done the same thing in the same situation, but Paul certainly did. Verse 25. But he, meaning Paul, but he said, I'm not mad or crazy, most noble Festus, but speak, speak forth the words of truth and soberness, serious, necessary things, things that have eternal value. I'm not, I'm not speaking everyday stuff. I'm speaking eternal words. What could be better? In the midst of complete scrutination, just simply pointing people to Jesus. Now, if they, you think that's outside the realm of possibility for the world that we live in today, just wait. It's coming. Mm -hmm. I'll live to see that. Um, and y'all might be coming down here to visit me two blocks down. And you know, I would to God that it had the strength in that day to be one of those. Not that I'm crazy, but that I want others to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That I, want, that I certainly want and desire others that they might be saved from uh, the wrath that is yet to come. And so, Paul used this one opportunity, once again, like he always has, to spread the gospel. Verse 26. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom I also speak freely. Uh, Agrippa wasn't no dummy. Agrippa wasn't an ignorant man. You don't become king being stupid and undereducated. Now, what did King Agrippa know? He knew the English, I mean, excuse me, he knew <laughs> the Jewish history forwards and backwards. He knew the Jewish Bible forward and backwards. He knew of a king, of a, of a savior that was coming. He knew it historically. Sadly, that's the extent of most knowledge that most people have today. Every one of you should know, I hope you know, two miles that way was one of the greatest Civil War battles that was fought. Uh, when the Southern states lost that battle, the, the war was con essentially over in all the, all the states west of the, uh, of the Smoky Mountains. And we were done. 
Uh, but you know what? I heard it. I studied it. But I wasn't there. I'm depending on someone else's historical account of these things, right? Today, most people do the exact same thing when it comes to Christ. They depend on other people's account. See, Agrippa knew, but he didn't understand what his soul. The best I, I understand, Agrippa died a lost man. He had had an ear, let him hear. See, the problem was that Agrippa had no spiritual ears. He didn't he did history. I would say it goes so far that Agrippa knew that Jesus was in fact qualified to be to be the king of Israel, to be the promised son. But that didn't help him be that did it. Because he was spiritually deaf. He was spiritually blind. He had no understanding, no spiritual depth whatsoever. And again, the best we know, he died in that situation. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto him, Almost thou hast persuaded me to be a Christian. Probably one of the saddest verses you'll read in the Bible. Read this well, week if you will, Psalms 22. Very explicit description of the Lord's misery on our behalf, of Jesus on the cross, of dying for my sin and your sins if you've been born again. And that's about as far as the Griffin gets. Notice Paul, he, he's not frustrated with Agrippa. He just says this. And Paul said, I would to God that not thou not own and I and Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear this this day were both almost and all together such as I am, except these bonds. Now Paul wanted it, but it didn't cause it to happen. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Nothing, nothing here even stands in comparison to knowing you are saved. You probably don't have any kind of Damascus Road experience. I didn't hear lightning and thunder when the Lord saved me. Very quiet time when I realized I was a sinner and in desperate need of redemption. And I don't even know what I said audibly, but I know in my heart I cried out. Save me. Save me lest it be too late. See, one day it will be far too late. That's not on me and that's truth. And then what remains will be the most horrible years this world has ever seen. It'll make the Great Depression look like a picnic. It'll make like it'll make Hiroshima look like a day at the lake. I want to avoid that, don't you? Do you know? Him?